Well, hello, everybody. This is Randy Wooten, CEO of Maxio, and your host of SaaS Expert Voices, where we bring experts to you to talk about what's going on in the SaaS world today and what we might expect to unfold tomorrow. Today, I'm joined by Bill Halowski, who's the VP of Accounting Services at Cruise uh, Consulting. Uh, what an incredible background you've had, Bill. We'll get into that in a second. And then also really excited about what you guys are doing at Cruise, which we'll also talk about. Uh, in a brief, Bill's journey, and please fill in, was started off in, in business office accounting at uh, KPMG, worked in implementations at Oracle, has done consulting, product management at, uh, at the U.S. public sector, federal and international e-business, also worked at SunGuard Data Systems, uh, worked at some small startups, and then has been at Cruise uh, recently, where he now, as I mentioned, oversees the accounting services, working to help uh, Cruise's broader customer set of 800 VC-backed startups, of which about 600 are SaaS. Uh, welcome, Bill. What an incredible background. Well, thank you, Randy. It's been an incredible experience trying different things and testing out and uh, just enjoying and learning and taking on the big, hairy projects. Yeah, and you've got more certifications than anybody I ever met. You've, you're a <laughs> CPA, you're a CGMA, you're a CITP, and a CSPO. For those that don't know, could you talk about what the CITP is and the CSPO is? Because it's probably not as common in the in the financial or accounting world. Sure, absolutely. Actually, I just happened to see those credentials on somebody's Zoom meeting and I stole them. And that's how, no, I actually just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so CITP, it stands for Certified Information Technology Professional. It's actually a designation granted by the AICPA. Uh, and it's focused on uh, you know, understanding tools and technology around the accounting and finance and auditing areas. And then uh, part, uh, much of my career I spent in product management and software development. So the CSPO stands for Certified Scrum Product Owner. So when you transition from the old waterfall methodologies into the Lean Agile, it really teaches all the tools and techniques and styles and uh, so super credential as you're moving to that Lean Agile uh, methodology. So really cool. That's, and I assume you had lots of opportunity to apply that in the companies that you've worked with in the product management component. And then I guess even in this role that you've been in in the VP of accounting services and how do you move customers through the sales cycle and get them up and running, the agile methodology is not just a product management methodology. It's a, basically a, a workflow optimization process. Would you agree or how, how have you thought about some of those applying to your current role? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with it. It builds a great foundation in terms of thinking about being very lean and agile, breaking down the minimum viable, if you will, story points and products. But when you apply that to, for example, the accounting side, we use it from a customer side, meaning what technology stacks do we need to get them in? When you're talking about small seed companies, two or three, you know, a founder, maybe a CTO and, you know, two or three staff, how do you get them to think about moving fast on the accounting side? Because these guys are growing and moving very fast on the startup side, right? On the other hand, as we apply it internally, we think about like little little tools and technology, and we actually build some in-house custom software. So we can do these little things to help us get more efficient, more effective, provide better client service. These methodologies really apply pretty cool. So uh, you know, rather than taking a big project, spending hundreds and hundreds of hours or thousands of dollars on it, try something small, fail fast, experiment, improve it and then start to roll it out. So I absolutely agree with you. Couldn't couldn't agree with, uh, any more than that. And I think what's interesting is I spent a little time at the AICPA uh, and I think one of the data points they uh, share is there's about 60,000 CPA firms in the yeah. US of which most of the long tail and they're single proprietors and they're managing the the uh, the ice cream shop down the corner or something along those lines. You guys are really at the top end. I think you're the number six fastest growing firm uh, by accounting today. Uh, you're in the top 100 firms and top in the Western region. So you're at a different order of uh, magnitude. And as part of that, it sounds like what you're able to do is build some of your own software. So you're in a tech enabled service as much as a service provider. Can you share um, like how many people do you have in your IT tech group where you're building your custom tools? We'll talk about the tools that you recommend and implement secondarily, but just like how much of an investment does your leadership team see is needed to drive efficiency in the delivery of your services? 
Sure. So I'll break it down to a couple of approaches. What we do is we look for, if you will, best in market for off the shelf or COTS, right? So for example, we'll use Salesforce for our sales and marketing, and we're actually implementing uh, the service cloud. We use Zendesk. So we use some really great off the shelf tools. It's called, it's rebranded to Cantata. It's Maven Link for project management and assignments and workloads. And then on the custom side, we build stuff that uh, help us really generate the financial packets, a lot of our deliveries. We have custom workflows behind the scenes because we do different levels of review by different staff to ensure that we've got not only the proper attention and to focus on the, 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 the data and the accounting, the categorization, producing the financials and levels of review. So. But yeah, those are those. From an engineering perspective, we offshore the engineering piece. We've got awesome. some fabulous folks in Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was uh, maybe eight, nine, ten, you know, staff we involve out there in different projects. It goes up and down depending on if we're doing something new or if uh, we've decided to deprecate or into life something. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that firms will need to do is learn how to leverage technology, either the off the shelf or build their own. And we'll get into AI and a little bit of what's playing out there. Uh, but then you also have, with your background experience, um, I think bring a very unique view to the tech recommendations you make for your 800 customers, those that are seed or even um, uh, you know pre-seed to seed to series C to D. Can you help us understand how you think about, you know, not one solution, not one recommendation is going to fit all of those. Maybe for our, for our listeners are mostly in that probably series A, series B. How do you think about the set of tech you say, this is going to make the back office efficient so that you can grow your company and, and scale and be able to raise the money and go through the audits and get through the due diligence? Like, how do you think about that set of technology you recommend? Sure. One of the first things that uh, we we do is we want to get a good baseline. So, for example, uh, you know, QuickBooks Online, it, we we probably have about ninety seven ninety eight percent of our clients are in QBO. So it's sort of like one of our base, if you will. I wouldn't even call it an ERP. It's a GL with you know additional features, right? So it's it's easy startup. We've got cut. We've got um, if you will templates for chart of accounts for like B two B SaaS and fintech, and we can actually roll them in pretty quickly. For some of our early companies, seeds and A's, we might have spreadsheets. We might have Uncle Bob who did their books, and right. you, know, you you got it right. Right. So it's a it's a whole cleanup because we follow U.S. GAAP, you know, generally accounting accepting principles, right? And uh, what we do is then we look to see where they're at and sort of when when's their next fundraise, how much have they ris uh, have raised already, and then do they have KPIs? So for example, I need to hire five people, ten people, twenty people. So we'll we what we'll do is we'll work with certain like really great third-party technology vendors. So for example, um, on the payroll sides, we may recommend or we may say, hey, here's the top four or five payroll providers we see startups using and working with. But we have many startups that come to us already using payroll systems, you know, mm -hmm. the, the big ones, ADP, Paychex, you know, JustWorks, you know, all those. So in those cases, we'll support those. And then for other technology stacks, we'll look to say, hey, what are you doing for expense management? Are you using credit cards, right? What about treasury management? Then, of course, with uh, out of our 800 VC-backed startup clients, believe it or not, which blew my mind, is about 50% of our startups actually are generating some form of revenue. You would, you know, counterintuitively, you would, you would think, oh, maybe 90% aren't generating revenue. So out, out of those that are generating revenue, we've got Stripe, Shopify, we've got Apple Pay, Google Pay, Amazon, a bunch of those tech stacks. And if they if they aren't already using one, they're very familiar and comfortable for the small ones. Some folks, if you're only doing one invoice a month, I've seen them use Word or Excel, we'll get them into QuickBooks. But if you're really focused on the B2B and SaaS market, we look for setting up products like Maxio because what it does is it builds the process, builds the procedure, gets them going. And then, you know, when you look at the startups, what they're doing is you're looking for a hockey stick growth, right? I mean, that just that exponential two, three, four, yeah, five, six, seven, eight, eight, two, eight, D three, right? Triple, exactly. triple, double, 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 yeah. right? Yeah. So in those cases, what we'll do is we'll build a foundation with it, with a technology partner that we know is going to let them grow and scale. Cause we don't want to like, Put you on something and six months later when you've doubled tripled quadrupled in size now you got to change your platform so it just doesn't make sense um do you have a, 
on on QBO because a lot of our customers are QBO as well because we're in that same space. They eventually migrate to NetSuite. About ninety yeah. percent of the people who move GLs go to NetSuite versus Intact. What size company do you find that uh, to be where they where consider moving to NetSuite, or is it an inflection point like they raise a Series C and those investors really want them on NetSuite, or is it a PE firm that says, "Hey, we're going to buy you, but you got to go on NetSuite"? Like, because QuickBooks Online can be pretty robust, and with tools, Max is one example of where we can help solve the multi-entity challenge and provide more governance, multi-currency. Um, but where do you find that uh, breakpoint where someone would try to replace a GL? Yeah, generally, it's sort of, um, it, it, there's not just a hard, fast rule, but sure, when sure. you go into series C and D, you're raising, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 million, and your KPIs say, I need to grow and scale real fast. The, the other areas we have, we have absolutely seen, hey, one of my, it, my lead VC investor says I need to move, or at this point, they're starting to hire in house, they bring in a, right, maybe right. A, uh, vice president of finance, maybe a fractional CFO. And the CFO says, hey, we're, where we're growing right now to hit those next milestones, we've got to migrate into, you know, the, the mid-market, a little more robust system. So we have a couple clients on NetSuite and a couple clients on Intact. Great. That was going to be the other question I had for you. So the technology, there's an inflection point often driven by the amount of money that's being raised, the accountability, visibility, and governance that the, the new investors want. On the services side, you oversee the accounting services and have order of magnitude about 40 assistant controllers, which is a great role to have. So it's a step up kind of from the bookkeeper to the person who's actually going to manage the books, help you sh ensure that you're getting your cash flows correct on accrual accounting. What happens when they do hire that CFO? I assume you still are able to provide audit services, but on the accounting side, are you augmenting that that first CFO for some of those B2B SaaS companies? How does that relationship evolve yeah. as you get to that series B, series C? Sure. So yeah, great question. So a, a couple, you know, a couple of thoughts around that. Yeah, we're about 40 assistant controllers, controllers. I probably have uh, 15, 20 CPAs on staff. I've got CMAs, CFAs, uh, you know, you name it, the, Cam the Campbell soup of TLAs and credentials, right? Um, what we do is when our, so we have a couple of different, what we call successful exits. A six successful, if you exit from Cruise is I graduate in-house, meaning I take my accounting, I'm acquired. Um, and so those are like really two great exits. And uh, right. what we do is when you get to that certain size, uh, we, we, we will highly recommend, look, the way you guys are growing and scaling, it's time to bring on a fractional CFO. We actually offer that, but but with a big demand, mm -hmm. we work with a lot of other fractional CFOs that do a phenomenal job. In some cases, they might right. be ind industry experts. They might bring on a controller, and what we'll do is we'll actually support them in the in their learning process, if you will, training, work with them on their schedule, showing them what we're doing. And then in many cases, like for example, we've had several clients acquired uh, you know, by some really big publicly traded firms like Apple, Cisco, Merck, uh, Spotify, you name it, John Wiley and Sons and Moody's. What we'll do is with those acquirers, we'll actually support the uh, all the accounting transition and functions until they're ready to bring it in house. But yeah, it's a good relationship because what we're doing is we're helping to set up the new folks for success and that nice transition. I think that's probably one of the things that we hear from multi-time CEOs is how much getting the back office right early makes cool. a difference. And so working with a partner, moving from your Uncle Bob to a book paper, <laughs> to a professional CPA firm, to what I would suggest is an accounting firm that is focused on B2B SaaS because the yeah. 606 rules, how you do uh, when you move from cash to accrual and how you do your revenue recognition, how that impacts, for example, um, well, rolling down the order to cash, how that can be impacted by revenue leakage, like having a, a, a group of people that really know this sector and have lots of experience doing it. And then you move to this next stage. And what does that look like? And when do you, when do you have to actually bring someone in house? Can you save a little money and not have to spend that $250,000 on a CFO for a period of time because you have a great partnership? And then clearly, you know, as they move on, they you work with those VCs and PE firms. They get to know you. They like to have your type of team on point. And so when they're doing their early stage investments, they make recommendations. And so that industry specific focus, I think, probably pays pays dividends for you. Yeah, absolutely. It really does. <clears throat> it, what, what it allows us to do is build that deep industry expertise. 
<clears throat> and so we can, you know, provide, if you will, you know, the, the, the recommended platforms. We've got certain templates and processes and procedures behind the scenes. And then, you know, when you look at revenue recognition, you know, complex topic. And when you go in, when you, typically when you go to BCD or you're getting acquired or you're doing a big fundraise, there are going to be audits, right? So by having the processes and systems and having the ability to show what you're doing and how you've done it and have all the backup and data is incredibly important because that's it just it, it just makes this fundraising so much more smoother and then the questions become less and then you know the books are in great uh, in a great spot you feel and if you think about it from the from the founder of the startup perspective it's incredibly stressful you're trying to get that term sheet signed you're going through due diligence you've got an acquisition possibly right or, oh my God, you know, I need that, I need that next big round. And if I'm a mess, it's a disaster, right? So I think by working with firms like us, and there's a lot of great firms out there, we, we give you that sort of sense of process procedure. We've had we've had hundreds and hundreds of audits uh, across the startup community uh, for our clients. And uh, you get you see everything. And uh, but you're absolutely right. Getting the tools, process, technology, and and really using the you know proper methodologies. I think is fantastic. It just sets you up in a good spot so you can grow and scale, you know, whether you're going to IPO or you're going to stay private, um, you know, it just really builds that foundation. I heard someone, it's actually an Atlanta based law firm, but they're national that, and this has been reinforced by other folks. The number one deal killer is an accounting issue. Yes. And it, in B2B SaaS in particular, and it comes down to how you rev rec. And, exactly. Um, I did a short stint two years after I sold Percolate to Seismic. I stayed on as chief strategy officer. I was overseeing our M&A deals. We looked at a bunch of deals. We actually did two acquisitions and one strategic investment. One of the acquisitions um, was 10 times bigger than the other. That the, the big one was on SaaS optics. So it had all that, um, all their stuff was in one stock yeah. in terms of the, the data and the reporting and the ARR and the MRR world forward and the cohort analysis, um, we ended up for the, for the other acquisition, which was one tenth of the size, spending 10x the time and money on the forensics accounting yeah. because they had contracts, uh, you know, in the filing cabinet. And so it just <laughs> yeah. created yeah. a lot of uncertainty around the, the, the quality of the earnings and they hadn't gone through an audit. And so it really, as an acquirer, having stuff buttoned up with a with a partner who knows the space and a technology that works, uh, Ken, to your point, just for the CEO and the executive team that's trying to sell the company by doing the, the deep dive and the due diligence on the technology, the sales motion, the marketing, the customer yeah. success, what you don't want is to be getting caught in your underwear around accounting issues. Oh boy, absolutely. Man, you're spot on. And what's interesting, when we when we do transition new clients to us, we do a KYC and due diligence. And we've seen some crazy stuff on the books and balance sheets. And so what we'll absolutely do is go back and recast and redo and bring it up into standards. And in some cases, we actually offered to go ahead and amend taxes so that everything is in sync and matches. And it's really, it's really funny. So, you know, here's a funny story we've got. We we have some very savvy financial, if you will, uh, uh, founders, right? We've got some that are these special research scientists and can't spell debit or credit, right? And so it's really hysterical. But we've got folks that, hey, you know, here's my revenue. And they're talking about bookings, not signed contracts. And, you know, they think it's committed. They're counting like, man, I'm going to do, you know, 10 million in revenue this month and next month and the following month. And you're like, no, you're not. And they're like, what? <laughs> and yeah. then you gotta, you know, they gotta explain that to the board and the VCs. It's kind of like, oh. all right. <laughs> yeah, I, it's you it's not something you want to do as an English major. As myself, I just want smart finance people. The books are gap, <laughs> right? Like, there's no issue. It looks the same way every single month. Uh, but great. Well, good. Well, let's um, transition. You had this great description of what was going on in the accounting and the startup world. You called it the catastrophization. Maybe I said that. And we were talking about how it just seems like there's one catastrophe catastrophe after another, which is impacting the way people are running their businesses, the way they think they're getting capital, how they're building things, the, the black swan events, the COVID, the yeah. SVB. Can you talk a little bit about your perspective of how this has been playing out over the last couple of years? Because God knows I've been in the middle of it and it's just felt like being a ship in the stormy seas and just getting blasted from the left and blasted from the right. Yeah, definitely. It's been, <clears throat> it's been quite a roller coaster ride. So uh, if you th if you think about it, when COVID hit, yeah, and when we were looking at our startup base, it's like how many how many startups are just going to shut down and go? 
so we had we had founders that were doing um, actually in person events. They were doing a lot of, if you will, physical stuff. And boy, what was interesting is many of them had to stop and pivot. And then the the uh, the, the cool thing was we saw the government step up and do a lot of funding, PPP loans and really helping the, the, the startup markets, I mean, generally business, right? So being able to be very flexible and nimble and pivot. And, the, and you know, one of the things I tell the team is don't panic, use the data. Mm-hmm. So for example, okay, oh my God, you know, if the world shut down, we need to furlough and fire everybody, right? <laughs> well, no, stop, right? What was churn, you know, last year? What's happening this year? Is there funding happening, right? So you want to want to look at the metrics and the data, and then you know if you think about it, <clears throat> yeah, we go through these crazy events, right? So you go from COVID, you go to the PP funding, and then we go into the SVB, the, the Silicon Valley Bank crisis, right? We had about I think almost four about half our clients mm-hmm. were in Silicon Valley Bank <laughs> that whole week and that weekend. We're going, what if our clients can't make payroll next week? So we're working with all the other banks and behind the scenes, and I mean, just working with clients. So it was, it's stepping back and keeping the focus on the clients and helping them. And we reached out to all the big banks and, you know, successfully helped them move their money. That's great. Cause I was actually in um, Sun Valley at the time of that. I had, I was with some friends for a ski weekend when that this SVB thing was unfolding. And I remember it was on a Thursday yeah. and was talking to my CFO, how do we get our money out and battery? A lot of their money was also in SVB. All of our money was in SVB and it wasn't like we were knuckleheads. It's SVB gave you great loans. Exactly. If you put all the money there and you did your checking with them and you did all, you know, you had your credit cards with them. And so it was part of Everybody, I think, especially uh, even though Maxio isn't a, uh, a Silicon Valley uh, based company, it's based out of Atlanta. Its orientation is Silicon Valley. And I think everybody in Silicon Valley was using SVB. Yeah. And I remember then on Friday, we're like, I don't know what's going to happen. And we're not going to make payroll on Tuesday. And um, but I only had to worry about one company. You had to worry about 400. So without you know getting into too much detail, how many were you able to help get funds over the course of that the long weekend from Thursday to Monday or till Sunday when the government stepped in, it was a couple tens or was it a couple hundreds or? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have the actual numbers, but we transitioned yeah. the majority of them to the big banks like JP Morgan, Chase, Bank of America. Wow. So I don't, I don't recall. I, I don't think we lost a single client in that. Now there was a lot of sleepless right. nights and anxiety and panic, right? Yeah. And, and there were some clients who were like, why would I want to move my money now? Because it's in the safest place that there is. The government's running, right? Um, but yeah, I don't think we lost a single client to that that whole process. But it was a That's lot great. of work. So we it was yeah. So we actually we didn't move any money afterwards for that exact reason. We did open up accounts at some other uh yep. banks and and obviously SVB evolved and now they allow for those sort of things. But I, I do think it's a very interesting uh, lesson learned. We'll all remember as a black swan event. Ooh, yeah. uh, the other one you were talking a little bit about was the web 3.0 crypto boom and bust. Yeah. And how yeah. have you seen that play out through your uh, client base? So it's, it's, it's really interesting as crypto took off and then the web three trends happened. Of course it became a really big, if I don't call it a, you know, VC funding frenzy, but boy, you know, folks were really writing checks into the, into the startups that were impacting the whole market, which was really cool. So in a way, we had to become crypto and Web3 experts very quickly. And if you look at the so the, the, the gap, if you will, standards and methodology and the FASB codification was very archaic because, oh, it's an intangible asset. You just put it on your balance sheet and, you know, crypto goes up and down crazily, right? And so <clears throat> behind the scenes, we were working with different uh, technology partners, experimenting, experimenting with different ones. And then we were tracking what the FASB was doing. And then, um, uh, you know, just making sure we were adhering to the standards. And then as the FASB actually has changed the standards, behind the scenes, we're working with uh, all the, if you will, plat- platforms that help all of the transactions and categorizations, because there could be millions and millions of token transactions coming in, right? Uh, and so it's working with them. And then you, know, you saw the sort of the, the winter, right? Uh, we've saw the SEC and the government come cracking down. And so when the VC funding starts to slow down, then, uh, you know, you're not seeing many new clients come in there, but it's supporting the current clients that are doing business or that they're pivoting. So that was, a, you know, yeah, the crypto boom and bust was another one we're seeing in AI right now. I'd say, I'd probably say nine out of every 10 new clients we onboard 
has probably got AI in their name, AI in their mission. And we, I probably have seen, you know, 25, 30, 40% of our clients pivot and add AI into their mission, their products, their MVPs. So, you know, AI is now the biggest thing that's happening. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. At, uh, I was CEO of a company, public company called Rocket Fuel, and it was for a couple of years and all the people had done all the hard work before I showed up. But we were built, we had our own data centers because we were processing mm -hmm. so much data so quickly. They were like the you know, Cadillac of data centers. There were 20 something yeah. around the world. We had 20 something models that we were updating, algos that we were updating every night. We had 30 data scientists. Wow. And we were real. we were in that first gen AIs. I was there from 2015 to 2017. It was predictive analytic using logistics logistic regression analysis. One of the things we found was in that first gen of AI, you had lots of companies that would just throw AI in their name or they would talk about AI. Yeah. And, and then it kind of became passe and like everyone sort of, oh, Fufu, you don't have any AI. I do think this next gen of uh, uh, AI companies, most of them actually do have something that is, could be called machine learning or is using leveraging large language models. I think um, do you, are you close to them? Do you have a point of view in terms of the clients that you're seeing and whether they're real AI or they're just wrappers on top of chat GPT versus having real systems of record of data that they're layering intelligence on top or how, how is that when you poke at it, are they, yeah. are they really AI or pretend AI? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think there's a combination. So for example, uh -huh. for, for, you know, some clients, what they're doing is they're actually augmenting with AI. So they're, they're wrapping the chat bots and uh, introducing new features and functionality. We actually have some clients that are true AI. For example, Perplexity is one of our clients that we, uh, that we serve. And it clearly is, you know, just a big competitor. And what it does is it really does the, if you will, the sourcing. So it tells you when you ask a question or you need advice or help, it tells you exactly where it's pulling from and what it's coming from, right? So, so it, it helps to reduce. So you can't eliminate, but definitely reduce hallucinations. But yeah, we're seeing we're seeing great, you know, great uses in some really novel areas where, um, you know, folks are using uh, the the AI. For example, there's a couple of our clients are in, in uh, marketing or entertainment and education, and they're using those tools to reduce basically, you know, the cost of effort, the cost of sales to actually build and deliver some of their services and content and features. So we're seeing a lot of it, just really cool applications. Are you, I'm kind of putting you on the spot going off script. Uh, one of the things I've seen around through the CEO community is uh, a slide which says, this is the AI efficiency expectation by function. So yeah. Uh, for developers, for marketing, for sales, for customer support in particular, each of the, even GNA, each of those functions having a efficiency gain by using AI. Um, what I've been arguing is standby that fiscal year 25, the plans we have to put in place, there will be a requirement from the private, uh, private companies that are backed by VC and PE to show the scale and leverage they're getting from using AI tools uh, for those. So you don't have to hire this many engineers. You don't have to hire this many customer support folks, which is going to help drive overall profitability if you're able to scale. Have you, if, across your customers that aren't, um, I mean, you could have AI within your product, you're selling that, but I'm talking more about augmented intelligence, augmented workforce. Are you starting to see that play into, okay, so now how are you going to change your budgeting and forecasting based on AI assumptions? Yeah, we're definitely, I, I think you've characterized it spot on standby right now, where I still call it in the early exploratory testing, okay. you know, MVP stage. <clears throat> and so we're seeing a lot of different applications of it, <clears throat> but, but I haven't seen a demand for metrics and commitments and KPIs against, okay, hey, because I'm, I'm using uh, AI, I'm hiring three less engineers. I haven't seen that push yet, but man, I tell you, it's going to be coming. You're, I think that's a great foresight. It's going to be coming. And uh, as you look at, you know, you're, you're hearing, you know, I'm, I'm hearing uh, uh, predictions that we can get to one and two or three or four people companies that do a billion dollars. Yeah, I've heard. Who's like, the first company that goes uh, public with just executives? Yeah, Everything exactly. else is done through bots. <laughs> Um, I think that will be interesting. I'm glad I'm at the tail end of my career and yeah, you know, hopefully can get done and ride my bike and don't have to worry about it. But my son, who's going into, uh, uh, was going to go to college in the next year or so is looking at computer science. I'm like, dude, this is the intersection of robotics and AI. You just got to yeah. be there or yeah. you're going to be flipping burgers. Um, 
All right. Well, good. Well, let's talk about one last transition, I think, just which I was really interested in your hiring philosophy. But to set the context around how you guys hire at Cruz and some of the things that you've done differently to hire people who don't panic, who, who focus on you know <laughs> being stable, is just this broader labor shortage that we're seeing specifically right. in the accounting uh, area. You had provided some details in terms of uh, in 2017, there was 75,000 accounting graduates. In 2022, there was 62,000. That's a decrease of 17%. Similarly, on the CPA side, you said in 2016, there was 48,000. Um, and in 2021, only 20, or excuse me, 19,000 passed their CPA. That's extraordinary. Absolutely. It's uh, been incredible. And you're, you know, the last, the current, cat, you know, catastrophization in accounting and services and auditing is this, um, you know, lack of skill sets coming in. And so there's a lot of discussion around the barriers. So, for example, the 150 hour requirement and then, uh, you know, states require, for example, a year of working under a CPA or in a CPA firm to get the, the, the qualification or credentials. We're seeing the declining graduation rate. So it's actually becoming more and more of a, you know, uh, of a, if, if you will, industry pressure. Now, I mean, a couple thoughts for us is we typically, we don't, we don't hire right out of school. We have done it. We're looking for, you know, folks anywhere from one to two, three years experience, all the way up to very experienced uh, controllers, fractional CFOs. Um, but I, I think also too, by using the tech stacks, and I can really see AI starting to impact that where, hey, you know what? You're going to be able to deploy the tools and technology and systems where you can do more with less folks. Um, and, you know, for us, <clears throat> we don't compete against the, you know, the big four, the, the really big ones in hiring. Um, and I, I think the, the, the other strategy we have is we're 100% remote. And so that really gives us back that edge. We, we used to have the edge prior to COVID, and then that edge went away. And now when you're seeing the, the demand of coming back to hybrid work you know, work hours, you know, bums and seats in the office. Uh, you know, some of our top criteria coming in, we talking to candidates is, hey, you know, are you truly 100% remote? Do I have to go anywhere and do anything? And we're like, absolutely we are. So, so that's definitely a benefit, but I could see, you know, you know for me, I think as the, as the expertise declines, you use the tools and technology to, in, to basically account for some of that. And then you want to make sure that you've got the, if you will, the, the building blocks around that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been a challenge, but, uh, you know, I think we're in a special space. Um, you know, the startups and, uh, you know, VC backed, it's pretty sexy. So we've actually, you know, haven't had a lack of applicants and candidates. I mean, our, our, we've been hiring and growing like crazy. Like you mentioned, we hired over 62 people in 2022 across accounting, tax yeah. and sales and finance. We did 26 people last year. And uh, so year to date, I've hired 22. So that's great. So I just double clicking on this a little bit. You talked about in our pre-brief that you used to hire for technical ability yes. and now you're hiring for desire and customer service orientation. There's got to be some assumption of, of, of their accounting chops, right? You got to have the people that know, and maybe that's what you mean by technical ability. Like they're able to do the accounting. H how did you, figure out that you wanted to shift to this desire, um, motivation, grit, and customer service orientation within a, in the firm that you guys are, are building? Yeah, I think it's been sort of an organic process. Not really, it wasn't really planned. It's just a natural evolution. So at, at first we were hiring just super technical skills. We're looking for the credentials, the CPAs. You've been there, done that. You know, you've been in the seat. You know what it's like. <clears throat> and then you know, you, you get the stereo, the, the archetypes, the stereotypes of, well, you know, accountants and bean counters, they're engineers, you put them in the closet, they don't like to talk to clients, right? <laughs> right. And then, you know, with the tools and technology coming in, um, you know, what we're finding is there's some really cool folks that have got some very different, if you will, uh, bachelor degrees and backgrounds, maybe science, history, literature, art, <clears throat> but they found accounting and they love the numbers and they're doing a phenomenal job and they have experience. And you know, some go on to get the master's degree in accounting. So we're we're actually looking a lot broader and bigger. And you know, my philosophy is <clears throat> I can teach folks technical accounting standards and skills and how to do things, but man, I can't if you don't have a desire to help people, 
and service and, and just, you know, have that, if you will, customer service aspect. That's so, it's so hard to teach and ingrain. So, so we're leaning much more in that direction. And we use a couple of uh, tools behind the scenes like Caliper and we used to use Predictive Index, which helps us, if you will, fit and mold and evaluate, uh, you know, at least to our style, because the, 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 if, if you're in the standard corporate accounting office, you get your typical monthly closes, it's a cadence, you do quarterly, you do your annuals, right? <clears throat> Well, in the chaos and the, the startup world, it is anything but that, man. It is like every right. day, and, and we deliver statements, you know, every week. So, so right. It's, it's so a little bit of people you're you're trying to hire people where they have this strong adaptability, um, yes. uh, flexibility, uh, resilience. They're okay with chaos. It's it's those that can uh, be in the whirlwind. And, and they like that. They like the yeah. stimulation of that and they're not overwhelmed by it. And I do think the stereotypical accountant is someone, well, no, no, I want everything, all I's dotted, T's crossed. I want to yes. build a real sense of control. So how do you find someone who's still very focused on the details and make sure that it's right, but are okay with a little swirl? Um, t talk a little bit about caliber, because I think you were, you're describing caliber versus predictive index. I've used predictive index, but not caliber. Uh, it, it helps you better assess candidates in terms of their willingness, their flexibility, their willingness to handle remote work and just their energy, what they were bringing. What, what was it about Caliber that really turned you on? Yeah. So we we found a Predictive Index through one of our Vistage groups, uh, Vanessa Cruz, our CEO, yep. and they were like talking about Predictive Index. And we jumped into it because I remember when we we had, I think I think I had six positions and literally we went through 800 resumes. And it was the old manual. Oh my gosh. Right? So then we started. Holy smokes. Oh yeah. This was back in 2019 and 20. So we were experimenting with different tools. We found the predictive. And of course, you know, when you're interviewing and you're going through the resumes, you have all that, not, not only, if you will, uh, just bias, but subconscious bias, right? So we went into the predictive index and what we did was we created job, if you will, uh, you know, uh, uh, job assessments. And we're like, we want somebody who can do this. But what it didn't take into account for the uniqueness of remote work, of you know the chaos and uh, all these other variabilities, the characteristics that we have in our market, um, and so we, you know, I'd say our success went up dramatically. And then uh, we, uh, as we were growing and scaling, we hired a, a VP of HR and uh, Stacy Love, and she's I'm an expert in caliber, I love it, and she goes, this is what we can do with it. And so we just basically started it. Uh, there was some time last year, and now uh, you know we go through the process, and we about every, every everybody to the caliper scores and what we think is the right fit for Cruise. So it's a it's a great new tool. We're buying into it, and I've actually asked all my staff to take it so we understand where they're at and what their, if you will, uh, you know, what strengths and weaknesses are. So it's actually a great tool to help. Got us. it. So so it does both on your applicant screening to get the match. So you have the. Uh, you can in the in the job application you could test for the certifications and the technical ability, but then you also have this kind of personality orientation, values and beliefs. Right. You, it sounds like you're also using it internally. Yes. To have all staff use it. Uh, I've been a big fan of the personality tests, uh, the ones we are using it. Everybody at uh, Maxio is doing insights, which is yeah. similar to DISC or yeah, rooted in Myers Briggs. And I tell people it's like a year's worth of one of ones. When someone takes the insights profile and we have a chance to chat about how do we perceive the world and what our communication preferences are and more importantly how i'm going to piss them off exactly <laughs> right <laughs> and, uh, so caliber does something similar caliber has that component as well yeah, that, that yeah. personality orientation and how you prefer to be communicated with etc uh yeah i think those things are great it just it all these uh, it's just you know, software and accounting obviously is a people business yeah. and people is based on relationships. And so how do you establish trust, build trust? How do you facilitate communication? How do you try to prevent bad assumptions um, to make the, the machine work better? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you think about the cost of a hiring mistake, boy, you know, it's yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on, you know, how quickly and how long. And we spend a lot of time and effort to train because the, the, the startup market is unique. There's a lot of new terms that many, many accounting folks aren't, you know, uh, uh, didn't know or weren't aware of safe notes, right? Venture debt, uh, you, you name it. I mean, it's really crazy stuff that you have to, it's a whole new lingo if you have to learn. So. Right. Yeah. And so you spend all, what I, I think what you're pointing to is just you spend all this money to hire someone and then you spend all this money to train them. It's probably a year before they're even starting to do the payback in terms of value add versus the mentorship. 
Uh, before we go to the final round, that was one of the questions I had for you yeah. in terms of this remote first work. I think in your professions, the professional services, like, uh, law, accounting, I've seen this at banking and VCs. A lot of those firms are requiring everyone to come back into yeah. the office because they think it's critical to the mentorship. So do you have a secret in terms of how do you enable the mentorship in a remote type environment where you take someone who you know may know some basics, but they really need deep mentorship to, to build the capabilities and experience to be effective? Yeah, we've actually implemented a mentoring program. So when we bring somebody on new, we actually have a mentor from a different department that acts as their, if you will, corporate onboarding buddy. And that goes for you know, a period of, uh, you know, maybe a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, showing the ropes and everything. And then depending on the team, like on my team, I actually have uh, a direct peer-to-peer -peer mentor. We actually assign a mentor where that person can understand the accounting flow and what we're doing, how we're, you know, how we're operating our process procedures, our systems, and ask all those dumb questions. And, you know, so they feel like they've got somebody who is, you know, right in the seat alongside them. So that's really helped us tremendously, but it's, you know, like you mentioned, it's a big time and investment, but boy, those things we do early on just pay back tremendously, I, I think in the long run. I think having a very thoughtful onboarding process, like people remember their first day and the last day at the company, right? They remember the friends they had and the bosses they hated, right? That's kind of the dynamic. And so if you can make that wow moment yeah. uh, in that onboarding where they feel like you've made a bunch of an investment, they can, they feel like they have some friends, they have people they can talk to other than their boss. Uh, I think that is probably one of the biggest keys to that remote work. The other one is do you uh, bringing people together periodically so they can yeah. still have the... Uh, in-person connective tissue. Yeah, what we've done is we we do an annual offsite where we bring the whole team together, yep. and we have uh, we're probably sixty forty, if you will, U.S. based full time in contractors, and we've got contractors all over the world, seven or eight or nine countries, you know, Australia, the Philippines, Costa Rica, Trinidad, Canada, Europe, and so what we do is if uh, for our contractors. Hey, if you've been with us two years and you're working more than 30 hours a week with us, we'll fly you in and pay you, you know, pay all your expenses and bring you to the offsites. That's great. That really builds some phenomenal, if you will, loyalty and just team building. So we, we do that. I'd love to do it more. Totally. Um, but, you know, with the workflow, it's yeah. tough. I think, you know, with the, with the, yeah. the remote work too, what was really profound, I was chatting with, with our VP, VP of HR and she goes, you know what the remote work does? it actually helps level the playing field for folks with disabilities. And I'm like, wow, it, it's kind of mm. like, you know, no brainer, but boy, she reiterated that. And I thought, you know, that really gives, you know, folks a chance that maybe can't get into an office or don't want to, or have a challenge to actually, you know, really do phenomenal work. And uh, so I thought that was really oh, just a reminder of, some, you know, just real profound reminder. That's great. That, uh, yeah, the, one of the advantages of this whole new model. Uh, well, congratulations on your success, uh, Bill. Uh, before we close, I'd love to do our little speed round, which there's three questions. What's your favorite metric and why? What's your favorite book? Doesn't have to be a business book, be any book. And who's the influencer that you're finding most compelling? I, he or she is writing stuff that you're reading or your podcast you're listening to. So uh, with that, what's your favorite metric? Oh, my gosh. Well, I look at, I look at all kinds of metrics from all angles. Uh, so probably right. right now, I would say, if I look at it from, um, you know, my role, I would say it's uh, revenue per employee. So that's really okay. a big metric I look at. And uh, it, I use also look at it for benchmarking against other peers that are in the, you know, client advisory services space. So. Got it. So for you specifically in terms of your company, using as a revenue employee. Do you also use it for your clients in terms of helping understand the leverage they're getting out of their employee base? We, we don't look, uh, we don't per se look at the clients, you know, revenue per employee. Um, from our perspective, we look at uh, their complexity, their growth, uh, their fundraising. So we look at different metrics as I apply, uh, if you will, the cruise services to those companies. But uh, uh, yeah, we, we just haven't focused that on from a client perspective, but there's a, a ton of data available on that. And I think, uh, I think maybe yeah. you guys might have some of that. We, we, we don't have the revenue per employee. Our friend uh, Ray Reich for the wow. uh, bench market survey does, and that's a self-reported through his yeah. surveys. And so, you know, people have to give the right number. I would say the big thing that changed for me going from VC to PE was I was super focused on revenue per employee or ARR 
per employee yes, in a VC yeah. company, while still important at a PE company, what they're focused on is cost per employee. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. how do you drive that down to the bottom line? So it's been a it's a, been a rude awakening in terms of how to think broadly about how to build businesses and in different markets and different roles and the shape of the company in terms of senior employees versus junior employees growing your own. So it's led to a very, not very different, but a different way of viewing uh, what is the most expensive uh, yeah. asset at SaaS companies, 65 to 70% are uh, people costs. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and, and that was my the, rude awakening. All right. Like us, I mean, it's, you know, 60, 70, 80%. Oh yeah. Because it's all staff. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, favorite book. Ooh, favorite book. Well, I love all the big authors, you know, Christensen, uh, you know, for example, I love, um, yep. the uh, big books around Jim, Jim Collins and Carnegie. So yep. the, the, the yep. one most recently that I thought really just kind of helped me is called, it's called setting the table by Danny Meyer. So he was the founder of Shake Shack hmm. and some, uh, uh great. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. He really yeah. talks about the, 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 the need for client service and high quality and high expectations and team building. So I'm actually, we're actually doing a book banter. What we've done is we've told our employees, Hey, if you, if you get the book and you provide a one page summary, uh, so every week for the next couple of weeks, you in a couple of chapters and we share our thoughts. We actually, you know, provide them. We buy lunch and we're like, Hey, we're having a, you know, a book banter lunch. So it's a great learning and sharing experience. So that's really, uh, you know, one that's just very recent. But man, I got a ton of favorites. My bookshelves are full, and <laughs> my Kindles. Full. But yeah, that's probably it's, a recent. Uh, yeah, it, that's a great one. Um, had, had you ever heard of? I think it's called Be Our Guest, which is tied to the mm -hmm. Disney. Uh, I'm looking it up as I'm doing this. Be our but guest. See my guest or be our guest. Okay. It, it's a great book on client service. We used it when I was at Microsoft, and then we actually went down to the Disney Institute in California and brought our client, I used to run client service team, brought the entire client service team down there and go through an experience of how do you create the type of experience that Disney does for all of its guests. So I think that's a, that's a great one. I'll, I'll take a look at setting the table as well. All right. Final question for you, Bill, then you're off the hook. All Your right. favorite, an influencer. Is there someone uh -huh. you're reading or watching or listening to that you really like who thinks you're providing new insights yeah i'll uh, well well uh, i'll give you two or three here sorry to overdo it yeah that's my nature yeah. i always overdo it um that's right because we do yeah, all you're things. overachieving <laughs> we do all things startup one of the podcasts that that i listen to is uh it's called uh, this week in startups by jason calacanis prolific vc investor mm -hmm. and if you want to know anything about the vc market funding raising funds due diligence and from both from the founder perspective but from the vc perspective phenomenal podcast mm. i tell you who's hysterical okay. is jason Great. stats he does jason daily he is hilarious and pragmatic mm. and he talks about accounting firm issues and stuff he's actually done a lot of work in ai he's uh you know testing out different okay. use case scenarios i love him and then um uh, I, I i really enjoy it's called the accounting podcast it's blake oliver and david leary and they talk about all of the current accounting news roundup industries opinions and they've been they've been beating the drum on the declining CPAs, the weakness in the, in the talent, you know, and the 150 hour. So a couple of big ones that are related. It's some favorites, you know, Ron Baker and a few others, but uh, uh, yeah, sorry for the overload there, but I, I listen to these folks regularly. Uh, podcast is I end up buying these books and then adding these podcasts <laughs> to my list. And so it's just like I'm falling further and further behind, but I appreciate your recommendations and I uh, appreciate more of the fact you were able to spend some time with us today, Bill. It was always fun to catch up and uh, best of luck in your continued journey. Fantastic. Randy, it's a great, uh, thank you for inviting me. Great podcast and great partnership we have here. So thank you very much.